All right, everybody, let's get started. I'm filling in for Paul Smaldino today. He's off at the Santa Fe Institute. All right. Okay, well, it's uh, my pleasure to stand in for Paul Smaldino today to introduce Jeff Kloon, but I'll start by uh, acknowledging the Gleshko Samuelson Foundation and the School of Social Sciences, Humanities, and Arts for their support of this ongoing, long-standing seminar series. I think, Sean, you ran it the very first semester, didn't you? Or you were... One of the early ones. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, going on. <laughs> well, we had, we had a challenge of getting like five, six... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Back in the odds, right? That was right? That's over a decade ago. Anyway, it continues to go strong, and today's going to be no exception. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce you to Jeff Poon, who is uh, both in industry, a senior researcher at Uber AI Labs, and the Harris uh, Professor of Computer Science at University of Wyoming. Today he'll talk, talk to us about two of three things that he talks about often. Uh, let's all uh, give our speaker a, a warm hand. Thank you very much. It's nice to see all of you here. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks to Paul for inviting me and for all of you for being here and inviting me. So I'm going to talk about these two subjects here. Um, but actually, I'm going to cheat, and before I talk about these two subjects, I want to tell you about some of the things that I'm not going to talk about today that I've worked on in the past, in case you are interested and want to know about them, uh, or in case we're chatting later on today, for example, at dinner. So one of the things I've spent a lot of my career on is computational evolutionary biology, which is to say that you use a simulation of an evolving system to ask and answer open questions in evolutionary biology. So I've looked into, for example, the evolution of evolvability, mutation rates, altruism, how you can get open-ended explosions of complexity, uh, continual learning, and the last two I'm going to go delve into a little bit more detail, which is modularity and hierarchy. So I would normally give an entire talk on these subjects, but I'm going to try to do them in three slides. Uh, one of the pieces of work that we did recently is to show that um, if, if, you want, if you have a neural network like here and you're trying to evolve it to solve some task, you would expect that if the problem is very modular and decomposable into separate modules that it might evolve to be modular. You would be wrong. For decades, people have hoped and thought that if a problem was modular or if it changes in just the right way, then you would get this nice modular decomposition. We almost never get it in our field. We've thought for decades that if we could get it, we'd be off to the races and then you could evolve faster because you could rewire your building blocks, but it just never shows up in the first place, except for in very, very rare controlled conditions. And I was reading a neuroscientist textbook by George Strider, who's at the University of California, Irvine, and in the very back he says, hey, Ramon and Cajal in like the late 1800s suggested that maybe modularity doesn't evolve because it's a good uh, thing for adaptation. Maybe it evolves as a constraint solver. That it is that connections are expensive, you have to house them, maintain them, etc. And so maybe modular solutions tend to have lower connection costs, which is lower wires between neurons. Maybe that's where modularity came from. And he says, unfortunately, we can't test this hypothesis because in the natural world there will always be a cost for connections. And we said, aha, we can test that in, in silico. So we did an experiment where we evolved networks like this on a modular problem. And if you just select for performance, you get an entangled non modular network that's slow to adapt in a new environment to our new version of the problem. However, if you simultaneously select for performance and you have a cost for connections, either the length or the number, almost like a switch, you get these modular networks that then when you put them in a new environment, they are faster. They are faster to adapt because you can rewire the building blocks. So that's the cartoon. Here's the actual data. You can see uh, here, these are all networks involved just to perform well and they have lower performance over time and low modularity that stays low. If you add a cost for connections, then you suddenly see this modular uh, architecture show up. And you can actually look at these individual neurons and they do, in fact, decompose and solve the subproblems of the task and they get rewired to significantly perform better on new environments. We did the same thing with hierarchy. Now we have a hierarchical problem. And if you add a connection cost, you get a higher hierarchy. That's green versus blue, higher modula uh, sorry, modularity, green versus blue, and slightly higher performance. But look at the difference in the networks. These networks here have no connection cost, and these ones do. And again, the colors here correspond to the modules of the problem. And so it's hierarchically composing these different modules, and then it can use that to more rapidly adapt. So normally I do a whole talk, so that's very, very quick. But the papers are out there if you're interested. OK, on to part one of the talk, AI neuroscience, which is a question of how much do neural, neural networks understand about the world that they, they operate in? So uh, deep learning has taken off, and it's very, very powerful, and a lot of people are investing it and then deploying it. The question is, how much do those networks understand about the world that they operate in, and how does that relate to your understanding of the world? So unless you've been under a rock for the last couple of years, you would have heard about deep learning and what it can do. Here's a very quick tour. 
Deep learning is a computational brain, very loosely inspired by the brain, and it can do something like take this sea of pixels here and tell you that that's a lion, or give you some uh, text in one language and translate it to another language. It, I just want to impress upon you how very, very hard that is. If I gave you this picture, which is literally to a computer just a sea of numbers, this giant array of numbers, would you be able to look through this book of numbers and say scuba diver? No. Your brain is doing that subconsciously, but it's amazing and it's impossibly hard to think about how you would write code that would do that. And so you literally, in this case, these networks are extracting meaning from a sea of data, which is impressive. But they're actually nowadays about as good as humans on some narrowly defined tasks at performing these computer vision tasks. So here, for example, is the famous AlexNet, uh, which does well on ImageNet. And nowadays, neural nets are better than humans on this particular data set, which is a thousand different categories of images. And you have to say, you know, giant panda here or police van here. Here, the network gets it wrong. You can see that it's saying that it's a sunflower. But it's second guess is pumpkin. And you can kind of see where that looks like a field of sunflowers. So deep neural nets not only can see an image and say lion, they can look at an image and tell you all of the objects in the image. They can give you a caption for an image, which is rather incredible, such as taking this a picture here and saying girl in pink dress is jumping in the air. And when you see that, you think, oh, that neural net understands that image. But we're going to probe that question more deeply today. They are also behind a lot of powerful advances in deep reinforcement learning, such as sitting at these networks down in front of a video, uh, video games of Atari, and they can learn to play arbitrary Atari games making robots manipulate objects on a table, or beating the best human players at Go. Just within Google, Google, you can see all of these applications for deep neural networks. In almost everything they do, deep neural nets are behind it now. And uh, you know, IBM estimates this is a $2 trillion opportunity. And almost every company worth their salt is investing as much as they can into deep learning. So that raises the question of how it all works. Uh, with apologies to the neuroscientists in this room, computer scientists abuse the metaphor of biological brains tremendously and simplify them dramatically. The general idea behind a neural net is just that we are going to have, instead of all the complexities of single neurons that connect to other neurons in natural animal brains, we're going to have nodes that connect to other nodes, and all we do is have this neuron fire as a function of a weighted linear combination of the incoming weights. So this node here can activate that node there, and there's like a multiplier here that will either inhibit, like flip the sign, excite, or magnify the signal coming down here, and that allows these neurons to excite or inhibit other neurons that are downstream. That's the general gist behind a neural network. So that's it. All we have to do in learning is we have to figure out what are the weights of these connections, and usually a human will say how many of the neurons there are, and learning is just about figuring out the weights. That's not always true, but that's generally what happens, and it's what happens almost all the time in deep learning. So a deep neural net might look like this. You might give it a bunch of pixels. Literally, there's going to be input neurons for each of the pixels in this image. And you're going to pass those pixel values through these layers of neurons. These are layers. And these are called the layers, the weights between the neurons. And at the output layer, you might say, if you have 1,000 classes, you might have 1,000 outputs. And you know that this neuron should light up when it's a lion. And you train the network to say, when it goes from this image here to light up this neuron called lion. And notice that these things are in layers here. Now this might look like a very complicated neural net, but this is trivial by modern standards. Modern neural nets have a roughly a million neurons and 100 million weights, give or take, depending on the architecture. So they're huge, and they're impossible, and no human can tell you how they work. Uh, the way that we train them is via this algorithm called backpropagation. Uh, the general gist is you put this in, this pixels into the network here. There's a bunch of layers of neurons that go here, and eventually you get your output vector. And in this case, you know that this should be a line because you have a labeled training set. And you use calculus. This is an entire differentiable math function. And you just use calculus to say, how should I change all of the weights of this network so that this number goes up and these numbers go down? You do that for this image. Then you take this image, you push up car, you push down everything else, and you repeat the process over and over and over again on the training set. And then you deploy it, and it works better than humans at this particular test. This is called backpropagation. So, that's probably all stuff you've heard before. Now we get into the fun stuff. Because deep neural nets are huge and complicated, they are notoriously known as black boxes. It's very, very difficult to figure out how they work. And so what we're going to do in the first part of this talk is try to shine light into the black box to figure out if we can figure out a little bit about what's going on. So how do we do that? Basically, we enter the field of what I call AI neuroscience, which is that we're in the same situation as a real neuroscientist. We have a complicated artifact we've been handed, and we try to reverse engineer how it works to figure it out. Um, and it's roughly as hard. 
So, uh, one way amongst many that neuroscientists go about this task is summarized in this paper by Kuroga et al. in Nature in 2005. And what they did is they had patients who were undergoing surgery and had probes into their brain, and they could show the patients pictures and see when the nerve, the, when the neuron, the probe happened to land nearby crackled. And so you showed a picture of a motorcycle, nothing. Showed a picture of a waterfall, nothing. Showed a picture of Halle Berry, crackled. And they're like, oh, that's interesting. You know, what is this neuron? Is it a female detector, a human detector? Is it, you know, a white background detector? And so you might go through, you might show different pictures of Halle Berry, which they did, and the neuron fires for all these very different representations of Halle Berry. So pixel by pixel, this image and this image are very different, as is this line drawing image, but yet the same neuron is crackling. So it's all, and, well, incredibly, the same neuron will also crackle for this image, which is a picture of the letters that spell out the word Halle Berry. So for the philosophers in this room, this is like the neuron that has the platonic concept of a Halle Berry, abstractly represented in a neuron, or at least a set of neurons, that's firing for this abstract concept, which is very, very, very cool. So I would call that neuron multifaceted. It knows all the different facets of Halle Berry. Now, you might say, how do I know that this neuron is a Halle Berry neuron and not, say, an African-American actress neuron? I don't know that unless I've shown it a lot of African-American actress images that aren't Halle Berry and kind of tease that apart. But then it might be some other thing. And the, the, the fact is that you're never going to really know what this neuron is about via this method because you can't show all possible images to this poor subject who is sitting there with his eyes clockwork orange looking at the screen. <laughs> so. Uh, we, that's kind of a, an, an interesting and difficult question. Now, I would say that the ideal test would be if I could synthetically generate the set of images that light up this neuron, and only that set. And if I could do that, I should have knew all of those images, and I got this set back, then I could say, oh, that is actually an African-American actress neuron. It's not a Halle Berry neuron. But if I got this set back, then I would say, oh, it really is specific to Halle Berry. Now that's very difficult in the real world, but what's very cool is that you can do exactly that with neural nets, and that's gonna be the approach we're gonna to take today. We're gonna to try to synthetically generate a set of images that activates a neuron to learn what that neuron does, what it functions, what, fu uh, what it's learned to fire in response to. So how do we do that? Well, we're gonna take a neural net here, and the important thing in this talk is that I'm not gonna train these neural nets. I'm gonna take a trained neural net off the shelf, one that's already trained, because that's the whole point. You have a neural net, it's on your, uh, camera or your phone or you've built it for your company and you want to know how that neural net works. So you can hand me a neural net that you've already trained and now what I want to do is take a certain neuron like here and I'm going to have a computer artist that's going to generate pictures. And the general idea is the artist is going to generate a picture and initially a pretty bad picture and the network will, will show it to the network and will say how much does it activate this neuron here, this line neuron. And it might not activate it very much, but then we'll make some changes to the image, we'll show it back to the network, and if it gets a little higher, if the lion activation is a little bit up, we'll keep that. And we'll just keep doing that process. If it gets lower, we'll throw it out, we'll go back, and we'll make changes to the original again. So we'll hill climb in image space until we get something that maximally, maximally activates that neuron, and you would expect that we would get a lion. What's very cool is that you can also do it not just for this neuron where you knew that we trained and that, that, that neuron is supposed to be the lion neuron, I can do it for any neuron in the network. So if it's true that these networks have like hierarchically composed features, then I could have an eye detector, for example, somewhere in that network, and I could find the lion eye detector. Or maybe it's a global eye detector that responds to all like penguin eyes and lion eyes and holly berry eyes. I don't know. That's what we would discover. So that's what we're going to try to find. So we call this deep visualization because we're visualizing deep neural networks. So the first take of this uh, approach was to use a genetic algorithm, which meant that we didn't have to, we could just basically evolve an image. So we'll start with a, a population of, we'll start with the train network here. This is AlexNet. It currently, if I show it these pixels, it will say penguin 99% confident. If I show it a guitar, it'll say guitar 98% confident. And then if I use evolution to then generate an image, I'll start with a random image, I'll put it in, and it says guitar 1.3% for that image. Okay, that's pretty low. So then I'm gonna just mutate and evolve the image to try to like make a change, see if it's better, make a change, keep it if it's better, make a change, keep it if it's better. So eventually we'll get to images, spoiler alert, that have 99.9% .9 confidence for guitar and penguin, or any other class in image now. And you might think that they look like guitars and penguins. You would be wrong. We were very surprised. What they look like is this. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So when my student, Aang Nguyen, who is a uh, wonderful graduate student who did uh, most of the work that uh, I'm going to talk about today in collaboration with Jason Luzinski, when he first sent me these images, I actually thought we might have a bug. So that we spent the first week figuring out if, uh, if there was something wrong. And when we realized there wasn't a bug, then we had to stop and, you know, reflect on what this really meant. And I was just really blown away. I was surprised to see that like a neural net thinks that this is a bubble. It doesn't just think it, it's certain. It's greater than 99.6% sure that this is a bubble and this is an armadillo and this is a peacock. And we said, okay, maybe there's like an image hidden in there. It's like all this high pixel static noise that humans aren't uh, used to seeing. So we're gonna use this other encoding, which is based on a, a developmental biology, compositional pattern position network, stuff I'm not gonna tell you about. But the point is, is that this is method one, pixel by pixel evolution. Now I'm gonna evolve a low dimensional regular thing that blows up into a picture, so I can't get this high dimensional pixel noise. And now we get these images. So now, it's certain that this is an electric guitar, and this is a peacock, and this is a starfish. And obviously it's not. So then we were really like, okay, we have to share this with the world. This is crazy. We, this is method number two. We tried one more method, which is we actually use backprop. So here we'll take the weights of this network and we'll fix them. And then we can just use backprop to say, how should I change each pixel to light up this neuron? And that produces these images. They're a little easier to see over here. Uh, you know, basically you're getting bad garbage over and over and over again. You can kind of squint and see in a few cases why it might think that those are the patterns that it is, but in general, uh, the network is being fooled. We also went and tried it on MNIST, a similar data set, a simpler data set, and what you can see is that the network is perfect at recognizing these as zeros, ones, twos, threes, and fours, but then when we synthetically generate it, either rather the pixel by pixel method or the, the pattern producing method, the network is certain that these are fives, and these are fours, and these are sevens. And it thinks that there's no difference really between that seven and that seven. They're both basically 100% seven, guaranteed. So this is very strange. We then went and figured out that, you know, the, the natural thing would be like, okay, why don't you just take these images, these weird fooling images, and call, tell the network that those aren't nines and eights and sevens and fives and fours, put them back in as negative examples. Retrain the network, these should go away, right? No. Not at all. What happens is the network learns that these are not nines and eights, and it does get good at saying that those are not nines and eights, but then I take that train network and I say, let me produce a new weird nine, and it's happy to produce that nine. And then I'll train it to say these are both not nines, and I can produce that nine, and then that one, and then that one, and then that one. And as far as you want to go, you will never train the network to just in general say that this fooling stuff is garbage and figure out what the original nines are. And the reason is that you're basically playing whack-a-mole in an infinite dimensional space. The space of all possible images is so high that what you're not going to do is solve the problem by pushing down this example, negative example, and this one, and this one, and that's not a nine, and that's not a nine, because there's just an infinite number of weird nines out there that that's not a way that you can go about solving this problem. So, um, another mysterious thing is that images that fool one network fool others. And this is profoundly odd, and no one really knows why this is true. But if I take a neural net in my lab, and I train it, and then I produce a fooling image for this network, that this network thinks is a starfish, and this network calls this thing a starfish, and then I walk this image across the street to your neural net that you trained on a different data set with a different architecture, uh, et cetera, different hyperparameters, I will show this image to your network in much more than you would expect, not all the time, but saying, I don't know, 20, 30% of the time, your network will also call that fooling image a starfish, which is crazy. It's like all the neural nets in the world are sitting around being like, why don't these silly humans realize that that's a starfish? <laughs> They're in agreement on this. It's, we, maybe we're the outliers. So it's kind of fun and hard and deep to figure out why that's true. What that does mean, though, is that it's a huge security risk, because you might say, hey, my deep neural net that's running on my camera system, my security system, you don't have access to that network. You can't sit there and run a million images on it. You can't run backprop and calculus through the network to generate a fooling image. And the answer is that I can go to my garage, chain around that, generate 10 fooling images, walk across the street and show you, and the odds are three of them will fool your network. So that's a problem. So uh, here's another example of that. Somebody took our paper, printed it out, took their iPhone app, this is a startup that I uh, named Vicarious, that they had a deep neural net running, and through the camera with different lighting conditions, different angles, different data set, probably different architecture, the network was still fooled in the same way. And then the founder let us know through a friend, they're like, okay, now I believe your results. So we published this paper called Deep Neural Nets Are Easily Fooled. We wanted to let the world know that AI sees the world differently. 
um, and it may not understand the world as much as we think that it does. And it's also a huge security engine, or sorry, a huge security risk because um, these networks are being deployed throughout the world and you know you can have some network think that this is an open road that it can drive on or that this is a school bus, etc. So the question for this room that we're going to investigate a little bit more today is like why are these networks easily fooled? Um, what's going on here? And we came up with two different hypotheses. The first hypothesis is, and this is what we put in the original paper, is that the networks actually might understand what's going on but the test is bad. So imagine what neural nets do in high dimensional spaces is they put down what are called decision boundaries between classes. So I have the yellow dots here which are maybe lions and the blue dots which are dolphins and its job is to put a line between them so that when it sees a lion, on this side of the line is lion, on this side of the line is dolphin. Now when I go and I launch an optimization process that says what is the most dolphin-y dolphin imaginable, it's not going to put a dot right there nearby the space of dolphins, it's going to put a dot way down there in la la land it's as far away from the boundary as possible. Maybe that's why we're getting this garbage. So maybe it does know what a dolphin is. If I can constrain the artist to stay near the space of natural images, maybe it actually will know, and I'll get back a dolphin image. But my test is forcing it too far away. So that prediction comes with a test, which is that if I can constrain the artist to only produce natural images, I will recover the dolphin. But there's another hypothesis. I, I was wrong. This is the hypothesis we put in the paper, sorry. And that is that the network never learns the, what a dolphin is to begin with. It just learns the bare minimum about dolphins to solve the problem. So for example, imagine if you have, you're a neural net and you have to call all of these images uh, starfish. Well maybe you just learn if I see textured orange and some blue background, call it a starfish. I don't need to learn that a starfish has five arms. That means no matter how much I constrain that artist, the prediction of this hypothesis is that I will never recover the global structure of a starfish because they never learned it in the first place because they didn't need to to solve the task. So that is that these deep neural nets are locking onto unique discriminative features that are the bare minimum to solve each class and don't fully understand, like you do, the platonic concept of a starfish or holly berry, etc. So these uh, hypotheses have these two different predictions and we're going to test them. As I said, this was the prediction we thought was true and we put that in the paper. And I'll represent it by these scales. So if you're weighing, like, do the networks understand what it means to be a starfish or do they not? Right now, our early paper, our, this first paper that I've produced, uh, tips the scale towards the network not understanding what it means, what these classes mean, and it's just fooling us into thinking that they know what's going on. So that was take one. I'm going to just let you know that we're going to use the third method, the backprop method that used calculus to the network going forward. We're not going to use the evolutionary method anymore. So our, our second take in this vein was, okay, let's test this hypothesis. Let's try to constrain the artist here. We'll leave this network fixed. We're going to constrain this artist to only produce natural images to see if we can recover the starfish, the dolphin, etc. from the network. So how do we constrain the artist to only produce natural images? Well, Jason Yosinski sat down and said, I think I can hand code some rules of what I think an image is. Most images don't have high frequency pixel static noise. In most images, the pixels nearby each other are of the same color and then they switch. So blue, black, beige, white, you know, most of the white are nearby, they're all the same. So we hand coded a couple priors like that, prior expectations. On an image should get a penalty if it has pixel switching values, or if you have really extreme values of pixels, etc. He hand coded a few, and he's a smart guy. Uh, but before he did that, there were a couple earlier attempts. This group here, uh, tried to also have like a kind of a hand-coded prior, which was an L2 loss on the pixel, and you can kind of barely see, starting to recover some dalmatian stuff, but it doesn't really work. Uh, there's another group, uh, some of the same authors, they try to hand-code a different prior that comes out of computational vision. Maybe that looks like a frog. Not really, but at least it's green, kind of. Uh, and then Jason came down and hand-coded a different pr uh, set of priors, and now we start to see some more recognizable things. Um, like a pool table, a flamingo, a tricycle, but it still doesn't have the global structure. It just has like a couple of wheels here, and like you know, multiple copies of like flamingo heads without flamingo bodies, etc. But it's starting to look right. So this is our second take. Take, uh, and then we had a third take that I don't have time to get into the details of. But we used some different hand coded priors to try to get better, and now we started to really see the objects pop out. So you can see like a jack o' lantern, a golf cart, a wedding dress. Uh, strawberries, etc. And they're not perfect, but definitely that thing knows a lot more about what a jack-o'-lantern is or a strawberry is than our original results indicated. That was take three. 
And now this is really tipping the scales towards the network's actually understanding what's going on. In take four, we said, this is silly. We're machine learning researchers. Why are we hand coding the prior of what it means to be an image? Let's learn the prior of what, it means, uh, of what it means to be an image. So now we're going to use a neural net here as the artist. We're already using a computational algorithm, an optimization algorithm, but now we have a second, like a critic, a judge that's a neural net that's going to watch what the artist produces and it's going to give a score of how realistic it is. And if we can get a really, really good naturalistic prior on this artist, maybe good things will happen. And sure enough, this is what happened. So the screen's a little washed out, but if you look there or there, what you can start to see is things that really look like the objects in question. Like a full you know, lemon, a full pair of jeans where the colors are coherent throughout the entire pair, a pool table that has lighting, you know, lights in the background, a full shoe, lipstick, etc. And here's a, a, some more examples. And what you see here is not just the object in question, like a glass of beer, but the context that a glass of beer sits on a table, or that ostriches, who now have their heads and bodies in the correct number and alignment, are standing in front of a grassy field, etc., etc. So there's just a, you know, a nice amount of photorealism. Domes are under a blue sky, etc. So I haven't yet told you how this works. I'll tell you about that in a second. But I first just want to show you that it works. Here are a bunch of different am, am, uh, images of uh, you know, some synthetic stingrays or synthetic waterfalls. And then next to them are the real thing. So here are nine synthetic fake waterfalls that just came out of that same chain neural network that produced the same fooling images, but now with the learned prior. And here are the real ones. These images here are of a thistle class. And in fact, when my student Eng sent me the first draft of this paper, he had these images in the top right corner as our main image. And I started writing an email back to him that was like, hey, Eng, let's not put the, the real images as the first image just to show them what the data set is. Let's show them the, like, the best stuff we've had so far. And then I actually read the caption, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is the, these are the synthetic ones. So actually, had I swapped those, I bet you you wouldn't have known the difference, which is um, kind of interesting and has lots of comments on fake news and fake media, right? So as deep neural nets are increasingly going to be able to generate arbitrary images that are photorealistic, you know, say, image of Vladimir Putin taking, a, or uh, Donald Trump taking a bribe from Vladimir Putin with a smirk on his face, you know, you could say those words and the network would just generate it, you can imagine where this goes. So this was the first time I had been fooled by synthetic images that I thought were real. And um, that was kind of an, an interesting moment. So uh, how does this work? I just showed you the results without getting into like the technical details. So now I'll give you the technical details. So remember, the game is that we want to have a better prior on the image, which is the probability of an image here is represented as x. Our original work that was here just had like a loss, like an L2 law on pixels, and we constrained the optimization in some hand-coded ways. But um, the way that the technique, just to remind you, works is that you start in pixel space and you're going to optimize to light up a particular neuron in question. And in the original work, we just had like a, uh, we had like a function that took these pixels and like via L2 or via something else would like give you a score. What we're going to do in the new thing is we're going to have the artist itself be a deep neural network. And it's called the deep generator network. And the idea is it goes from some low dimensional code and it broadcasts that up into a full image. So if you're familiar with generative adversarial networks or GANs, this is what's going on in the generator network. It goes from a code to a fake image. So we have our artist here, it goes from code to image, and if I can train this thing to only produce natural images, then I can stick the two together. And now, instead of optimizing directly in pixel space, I can optimize in this code space to have a code that gets unpacked into an image that itself lights up an image in this target network. That's the general idea. We call this deep generator network-based activation, max activation maximization, or DGNAM. And uh, how does that work? Well, like I said, big if. If I can get a generator network that only produces natural images, then I'm off to the races. So how do we get this thing? Well, if you're a student of deep learning, then you've probably heard of an autoencoder. It's a pretty cool idea. The general idea is I take an image, and then I have a network process that image down to a bottleneck or, or code here, and then unpack it back to an image. And so I don't need labels anymore. I just say, here's an image, reproduce that image. Here's another image, reproduce that image. And the network then has to take this high dimensional data, compress it into this low dimensional space, and then put it back up into this image space, and in the process, it learns a good representation in here. It might have a nose detector in here, or a mouth detector, or a Halle Berry detector. 
in here if that is frequently represented in the data such that I have to unpack that a lot. So that's what we do, except that we don't train this part. We take a pre-trained deep neural net, the famous AlexNet, off the shelf. We go from image to code, code back to image. And then if we do that enough, we get our generator network that can go from code to image, and then I can optimize in that code space. Good. Now you might say, well, how do you train this thing? Mm -hmm. If I have an image, and then I produce another image, how do I score if that image is good? How do I score if it's the same image? Right? You kind of still need something that can look at pixels and see good versus bad. Right? We would not want a fooling image of a starfish to be called the same thing as the original starfish. So that's where it gets complicated. We are going to have three losses. This is the most technical part of the talk, so bear with me. And uh, I'll tell you what. The first one is that we just compare each pixel. And we see, all right, did you get the pixels right? The problem is that doesn't usually work in high dimensional spaces because you get really blurry images. Because the average of this and this is something in the middle, and you don't want that something in the middle. The second thing we did is that we, uh, well, let me explain that a little bit more. This pixel-wise loss, imagine if I gave you the picture of me standing here right now, and the autoencoder processed that and produced this, which is exactly me, but 10 pixels to the right. Pixel by pixel, that's a very, very, very poor reconstruction, and the L2 cost will tell me that. It'll be a very high penalty. So what we wanted was something that was like translation invariant. It got the semantics right, the meaning of the image right, without worrying about the pixels. So that's what the second one is. I'll tell you how we do that in a second. And the third one is this GAN, if you know what that is. It's a realism a system that's a game theory of like two adversarial agents, like a counterfeiter and a cop that are increasingly trying to make better, you know, the counterfeiter's trying to make better and better, more realistic money, and the cop's trying to detect real versus fake. And if you play that game long enough, eventually you get to a steady state where the, 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 the counterfeit money looks real, looks perfectly real. And the GAN does that. So here we go, some technical details. So we're going to go from X through the encoder to a hidden code, and from the code back through the generator to a fake image, x hat. And then I'm going to compare them in pixel space. That was the first one. The second thing, to get the semantics, I'm going to take both of them. And how do I get semantics out of the image? Well, I use a deep neural net. So I take both images. I run them through some trained neural net here to get the low dimensional abstract codes. I compare the codes. So did you get the fact that it's like a person standing next to a pumpkin right? That code maybe would give you that information. So you got to get the high level abstract notion right, the pixels right, and then we also have bolt on a GAN, which gives us some more realism. We found all three of these pieces work together. If you take any one out, it works worse. But that's what gave you those images from before. So uh, we basically, we were originally trying to do deep visualization to understand what's going on inside these neural nets. But it ended up being like a really good generative model. It was producing these really realistic images that were competitive with the state of the art results by other neural nets and other systems out there in the world. So if you compare them to some of the other systems out there, you can see these are more high dimensional images and they tend to be more realistic if you compare them to some of the previous methods that had, were around at the time that we did this including this one, which I think was the state of the art when we started. Some other fun things you can do. I don't, I can't, I can take not just one neuron and say, give me something that looks like a pumpkin, but I can say, why don't you give me an image that lights up both the pumpkin neuron and the fire neuron, or a piano and fire. And I can mix and match any of these concepts. So all of these images here are different categories plus the fire neuron. And what you get are these really interesting things like green pepper candles, and uh, castles that are like on fire, and a piano that looks on fire, and all sorts of super fun, cool stuff. So you can play with this as you like. Um, one, people, one thing that people ask us a lot when we present this work is like, is the network just memorizing one image? You know? Like maybe you have all these network, it's memorized a picture of a uh, beer glass before, and it's just spitting that back to you. Well, the answer is it's not. One test of that is the fire neurons I just told you. It was never shown a piano on fire or a green pepper on fire. Here's another example. You, oops, sorry. You can take the image here, like this bird or this lipstick, and look in the data set for the closest image, either in pixel space or any one of the abstract layers. What you can see is that this synthetic image looks nothing like the nearest images in the training set. It truly is just imagining new hamburgers and new pixel um, lipsticks and new <coughs> arches and things. Okay, so now, careful listener would start to say, wait a minute, you told me that we're gonna learn about the target network, the one that I trained at my company, and I wanna know what the neurons in that network say. 
When you originally tried to optimize an image that lights up that neuron, I got garbage, static, fooling images. Now you've got this system that gives me back a hamburger or a glass of beer, but is the understanding coming from the network that I trained or from this prior, this artist, this generator network? Is that where all the understanding is coming from? Good question, I would say. We looked at that, uh, and the way that we did it was through a couple different tests. One, which I really like, is that we trained the generator network to generate gen images from this data set. It's called ImageNet. But then we took this artist and we bolted it onto a network that was trained on a different data set, MIT Places, which has totally different types of images. And the same, this same generator network was totally happy to light up neurons in this target network of arches and art galleries and auditorium and ballrooms and waiting rooms. It had never seen these things before, but it knew how to constrain the search in order to light up this network, which had seen those things. So it really is a pretty flexible natural image prior. Another test is that we, uh, oh, sorry, here, are more, here it is more. I think they're really fun. There's an art museum that I really like. Um, another test, and this was pretty clever, I think this was Aang's idea, is we're gonna take the ImageNet data set, which normally has a coherent image of me, we're going to train the, the, gen, the artist as normal. We're going to freeze the artist. And now I'm going to train this new weird network, which is take all of the ImageNet images and cut them into four and sh shuffle the quadrants. And I'm going to tell you, this is a beer glass. This is a person. But now it's all scrambled. And then I will take that trained network that I learned on cut up beer glasses, and I will say, show me what you think a beer glass is. And I'm going to use the same original artist that was trained on the non-cut up images. See how flexible that artist is. And what you see is that the, the combination is totally willing to paint snakes that are cut into and wine glasses that are cut into and parachutes that are cut with a huge edge down the middle. And here's like a beer bottle with an edge down the middle. So it really is a flexible prior. So the understanding, I think, is really coming from the original network. It just needs to be constrained properly. We did that with colors as well. It's happy to produce Technicolor snakes. Okay, so that was take four. I think it further tips the scales towards the fact that the networks do actually understand what these concepts mean abstractly. So, why, are they easily fooled or do they understand? I think the answer is yes. I think it's both. How, what's my theory? So, imagine that this white box here is the space of all possible images. It's really vast. This heat map here shows the probability density of real images that you see in your lifetime. And it's a very small subset of the overall space. In fact, in reality, it'd be much smaller than this. Right? What a neural network does when we train it is it has to create that decision boundary that we talked about. Except in a high dimensional space, it's not a plane, it's some complicated hyperplane. So imagine that it makes this ellipse here to say, this is a lawnmower. Its job is to carve out all the lawnmowers in the real world. But it also projects that decision boundary way out into space, right? Into areas that we normally never see. So if you ask it, to, if you show it a real lawnmower from here, it'll tell you it's a lawnmower. If you constrain the artist to have high P of X, or a prior expectation over the data, in addition to a high class given the data, which is what that equation is, then you will get back a lawnmower with grass behind it. Just to say, if you constrain the artist to stay in the colored region, you get back a lawnmower. But if you don't constrain the artist, if the artist can go anywhere out here, then you'll also get garbage fooling images that are out in La La Land. So the network both understands what it means to be a lawnmower and can be fooled by anything off the natural image manifold. Does that make sense? Does that make any questions so far? We'll break it up. Yes? Can you constrain, can you constrain the space so that the lawnmower uh, space doesn't include the noise? Like, can you constrain the deep neural net space? So yeah. So the question was, can I train, I think this is the question, can I train a network such that it won't consider this a lawnmower, it'll only consider this stuff a lawnmower? And the answer is no, so far. This problem, since it was announced by this paper that I'm telling you about and a companion paper by uh, Shagady uh, and his collaborators about a year earlier on adversarial examples, has occupied the best minds in machine learning since the advent of those papers, which was at least like 2013, 14. And there are conferences, there are competitions, everybody is trying to solve this problem. And so far, 
there has been some minor progress, but the short answer is nobody solved this problem. And nobody yet knows how to do it. It seems really easy. You've probably got 15 ideas in your head. People have tried them all, and they don't work. So we have to go on to the 50th idea, the 500th idea, we're probably now on to the 5,000th idea. We're refining them. It's unknown whether or not we'll get there. I think that we will. But right now, this is still a wide open problem that nobody knows how to solve. Yeah? So I don't think I know how to solve it, but the idea of a generative model being a more fundamental part of learning is pretty well known in cognitive science, computer science. Uh, this whole idea that our brains are fundamentally sort of predictive processing machines is fundamentally means they're sort of learning the statistics of the world. In this approach, it seems like the, the generative model, so the generator is kind of like off to the side. Is there not an approach where that's a more fundamental part of the learning from the get-go as opposed to being the artist? sort of is a, you know, and somehow separated. Because it does seem like that's sort of the key here, right? Is yeah. this idea that you, you're sort of, you're learning to generate the, the, what, what, at, what's out there in the world, and then you can classify based on that knowledge. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, mm -hmm. So Yashua Bengio uh, mm -hmm. believes that's the answer. That mm -hmm. if you get a proper generative model, that it will exactly know the manifold of data, and it will know when it's off that manifold, and it will reject that. Right. Ian Goodfellow, who has also done a tremendous amount of work on and is a co-author with him, does not think that's the answer. And one reason is that I haven't had time to go into this talk is the other flip side of this coin are these things called adversarial uh, images. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they take an image that looks exactly like an ostrich and they use backprop to change just a few pixels mm -hmm. to suddenly make the network think that that image that looks like an ostrich looks like a school bus or something else. And to your eye, they are exactly the same. And Ian argues to a generative model's eye, they also would look very mm -hmm. similar. Because there's only like one pixel that's been changed. Right. And yeah. so your generative model would be like, that's an ostrich. Mm -hmm. The generative model in your head thinks that's an ostrich. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't recognize right. that that thing's been dragged across the decision mm -hmm. boundary by these adversarial examples. Mm -hmm. I would also point out that we are fooled by mm -hmm. images. There are optical illusions that make us think that one railroad tie is bigger than another, despite the fact that your brain knows it's wrong. You can hold up the line and be like, yep, those are the same. Oh, nope, they're different, right? Uh, and actually, Ian had a paper where they used some of these same techniques uh, to create fooling images that then fool humans and like make a human think that a cat looks like a dog, and so, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I am kind of a little bit more in the Yashua camp. I believe that if you really got it good, and then eventually in the limit, it would actually be able to recognize that one pixel is different. But these tell us that it's very, very, very hard. And maybe there's no... Um, uh, certainly not an easy solution. Maybe, maybe maybe you can't get to the limit with like mm -hmm. reasonable amounts of data and training. So I don't know. Um, it's you know, tempting to say humans are very good at recognizing uncertainty and knowing when something is like anomalous. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you also are a fool. So maybe that maybe that will persist. Yes. So are these natural image the natural image manifolds? Do they have certain common properties? I mean, look at them. Are they always connected like this or? Do they have these separate? Oh, they're almost certainly components? not connected like this. Yeah, that okay. was just for a cartoon. Um, is this an actual no, natural no, 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 no. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. This is just a total example. I just uh, wanted to make the point. This is a cartoon. Uh, uh, I probably Googled like heat map visualization and just took something off Google. This is probably like some island. In the <laughs> yeah. Are there equivalent problems for video or uh, networks that are designed to handle also behavior or? Uh, motion in a 3D environment? Everything. Hmm. Sound, music, video, smells, once we have deep smelling networks. <laughs> um, this is multimodal, and it doesn't just apply to deep neural networks. This also applies to machine learning in general. Support vector machines, deep uh, decision trees, they're all f kind of fooled by this in the same way. Um, so it gets back to this issue of supervised learning. If you're putting down decision boundaries, you're probably going to have this problem. And then how do you recognize proper generative models that model the manifold of the data and recognize when something's walked off of it? That's just a very, very hard problem that we're working on. Cool, yeah. So uh, is there any work has been done to understand the generative, generative networks? Because generating an image from a vector of resonances, I think we just get F6 layer from the deep dimension to in transform image. How transforming from a low dimensional vector to this such a big dimension vector. So is there any way work has been done to understand what's going on inside the deep generative network once it has been trained? Is it like uh, it is running, it is already have some pixels, like it bunch of cut, cut cuttings of images inside, merge them based on some computation? That's an excellent question. I'm about to, it's a good segue to the rest of the first part of the talk. Um, that is, uh, which is that we've done a lot of work on the 
original network, the processing network, to see whether or not a lion detect, like an eye detector is in there or a face detector. I am not aware, although the, the machine learning literature is vast and fast moving, so I'm not on top of all the papers. I'm not aware of somebody who's done the same technique on the generator side to show the same thing in reverse, that there's this eye projection, eye drawer or mouth maker. Uh, that would be really fascinating. So you should yeah, do it. I haven't seen you do that. You should, you should do know. it. You should do it. Speaking of which, I will move on to that stuff, and so the rest of the room knows what I'm talking about, and then we can um, take some more questions. Okay, so, so far I've been promising you that we're going to use this as a tool to look into the network, like we were just talking about, to see if there's an eye detector in there. But I've been only showing you images so far of the class neurons where I knew what the answer is. So now we will dive into a network. Uh, so this is AlexNet. It has layers, you know, one, uh, two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to seven. And let's take a look. So the first layer of the network here gives you your classic Gabor filters. Vertical edges, horizontal edges, blob detectors, etc. Everybody knows, knew that these existed, but as we get up, it was harder and harder to see before these techniques. When we get to layer one, you start to see like corner detectors and um, texture detectors of different varieties. Uh, when you get up into layer three, you get more abstract concepts. So you get like light shimmering on water or dusk over a mountain. It almost looks like Yosemite, which is appropriate for this campus. Uh, you get like this weird dog face detector and like a mushroom detector. As we go higher into the network, you get weird like hound dog eye detectors and bird detectors, car grill detectors. And then here's maybe like a, a bookcase or stack of papers, a bird, a bucket. So we do see this hierarchically increasing abstracting composition of features that are learned from data. Things get really weird when you get into the fully connected layers. These are no longer convolutional filters. I haven't told you much about convnets, but um, convnets take one filter and they apply it throughout the image. So you have like one eye detector and you apply that throughout the entire image to see if I find any eyes. The fully connected layers don't do that anymore. They just have all information connected, all information. So you get weird concepts like a one-eyed turtle or a dog bathtub and all sorts of things that are totally bizarre. Nobody's really figured out what's going on, like this arch over water feature. We think that's because it's a distributed representation that's in a space that we don't have, that's not constrained to be something interpretable for us. And then here's back to the class layer where I know it's an ostrich or a restaurant, et cetera. So one thing I also pointed out is that um, we were interested to see if neurons were multifaceted, which is to say, not just one picture of Halle Berry, but can I generate the entire set of images that, re that light up Halle Berry? So we tried that. The first take on it was to um, use a neural net. All, a neural net calls all of these different images bell peppers. So here are green ones and here are colored ones. And then we could reconstruct from the same neuron, the bell pepper neuron, a red version, a green version, one, a cluster, or two. This was with some hand-coded priors. Um, and we got back, like, it's hard to see here, but from a movie theater, we could get the picture of the inside of the theater down here, the theater at night, the theater during the day, et cetera. So we're getting back the fact that a neuron knows the multi-dimensional, multifaceted nature of the data. Now, one drawback to the approach that I've already told you, DGNEAM, is if you were careful, you could actually tell the difference between the, the fake images and the real images, because not within one image, but across images, they're very homogenous. Mm -hmm. These are all kind of the same. Even though some have three and some have two, they're basically the same view. Whereas these are a little bit different. Now, these are not just a random subset of the data from this class. They are the top, the images from the real data set that activate that neuron most highly. So these are the highest activated ones, and these are the ones we get from optimization. But the real data from this class is much more diverse, and it looks like that. So to some extent, we're getting what we asked for. We're asking for the maximal cardoon or thistle neuron, and that's what we're getting because that's the ones it's most sure are thistle, where it's much less, it's, it's much less sure that that is a thistle because it doesn't have the canonical um, thing that represents that class. So one thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to push on and try to make an even better generative model that would produce all of the data and give us the, not just one type of image, but all of the various versions of Halle Berry, which we call improved multifaceted feature visualization. So the last paper in this track is this paper, uh, pl uh, Plug and Play Generative Networks, which is take five. So it, the name comes from the fact that we were able to plug and play this generator with different networks here, uh, and we wanted to use that as a generative model. There's a lot of math behind this. I won't go through it all of it in detail, but the general idea is we're trying to go back to what you were asking about, which is can I get a better handle on the prior um, expectations for that image? So there's this thing that Yashua invented called these denoising autoencoders. They're very cool. It's an autoencoder where I take an image and I add some noise to it. 
like just random change some pixels. And I give it to this autoencoder. And now the autoencoder's job is not to give me back the original image with the noise, but to give me back the original image without the noise. Okay? And the general idea behind that work is if I have a network that can take a kind of a, gar a somewhat garbagey image, somewhat unrealistic image, and make it more realistic, then I have something that takes some, an image and makes it more likely. Which means that it kind of has a way to climb the probability in image space. Which is what we want. We're going to climb up, climb up that manifold from off the white to the top to the peak of the color. And all you do is you take the reconstruction minus the original, and that the, the Asher does some theory here with Elmer Lane that shows that gives you the log probability of the image itself. So now I can actually climb probability in image space. So what we do here is we have an autoencoder that goes from a code to an image back to a code. So I take the reconstructed code minus the original code, and I can take a step in that direction. So that gives us a new equation. Our new image now, we're going to be able to sample images in a sequence, is the current image plus the sum amount of making it more realistic based on this reconstruction error, uh, plus the original activate the neuron in question, plus just a little bit of noise. And that gives us a sampler. If you're a math person, it's a Langevin sampler without the rejection step. And if the neuron I'm trying to target is a class neuron, then it's a generative model that's conditioned on the class. And if it's an internal neuron, then it's a multifaceted feature visual visualizer. So now, going back to this data, these were the top nine real images, the top nine optimized images, the real random images, and now these are samples from our new generative model, mm -hmm. which are much, much more diverse, including generating some images that don't even have the purple thistle. So now what's pretty cool is we can walk around image space. Mm -hmm. This is the space of dreams at night when you're thinking about like different volcanoes. You can think, if I said to you, think of different volcanoes in your head, what would happen? Well, you think of some volcanoes, oh, these are washed out, but some that are kind of at night, some that are during the day, some that have smoke coming out of them, some that don't. You probably in your head have some with lava and orange <laughs> fire. That's just later on in the sampling chain. In fact, here are some more examples. You get dark, you know, night sky, day sky, snow on top, no snow on top, etc. Here is a big sampling chain through volcanoes where we take like every fifth volcano basically, and then we cluster them based on what they, um, uh, where they are, and what kind of volcano they are. And you can see that there's all this huge diversity of with fire, without. And I'll zoom in. And these are some of my favorite images of my whole career so far. I just love looking at these things. There's like really detailed snow dripping down the mountain, fire, lava pouring out. You know, there's all these different notions of like the platonic concept of a volcano. It's just pouring out of this network. It can just endlessly generate new synthetic fake volcanoes for you. So you, this is pretty cool. If you wanted like a VR, you put on a VR headset and you can like walk around the world and it would start generating fake worlds for you and you could like maybe tell it what you want. Like I want mushrooms, I want dragons, I want the volcano to be dormant or exploding and we just start to be able to generate these things. Here are different pool tables, blue felt, red felt, green felt, etc. You can watch a sampling chain. So this is a bird that starts out on a branch facing that way. And then eventually the sampling chain figures out to put it on like, on like a leaf ground litter and like the bird eventually now is like green leaf background and eventually it starts facing the other way, I think. There, it lost its head and now it's facing the other way. So you can walk around the space of it. These are different ones that go from art. Um, now I think we're going to go, yeah, these are different arches and couches. This is a fun one. You target, you tell, tell it to make it orange, and then you leave it that image and you change the target. So it has to turn that orange, morph it into a jersey. And now the image in the middle of that shirt will suddenly morph into the door of a church once we ask it to become a church, because it's trying to, um, as quickly as possible, get to the target class. Okay, so future work in this direction, um, we can generate full videos, entire virtual world, speak recognition. You can train a network to recognize jazz versus R&B versus pop music and then generate new songs, you know, and, that are high probability and um, hopefully good. Uh, we can try this on unsupervised and reinforcement learning networks and I kind of now want to add generative networks here because of your question. So you have to beat me to it or else we're going to do it. Um, and uh, we can also, uh, I think this is really cool. Christoph Koch contacted us and said, hey, can we do this for real brains? And I was like, maybe. So if you had like a bird and they could recognize a particular mate song, could I generate the set of songs that will activate that bird's neuron saying, hey, that's my partner or whatever. That would be super cool. Uh, I've done some back of the envelope calculations. I think it's within the realm of possibilities, but it would be fun and hard and we should do it. 
Uh, okay, the final thing I want to say, I think, on this uh, uh, subject is just look at the rapid progress. Like in 2015, we were generating this, and then this, and now we're generating these like amazing uh, sets of volcanoes and high, high D. So imagine, you know, give it 10 years and think about what uh, what's going to happen in this space. So the conclusions from this part of the talk, and I realized that was long, the next one's shorter, are um, that the, our initial fooling work suggests that the deep neural nets do not understand much about the space, the images that they classify. Work since has revealed that deep neural nets do learn a lot about the work that the, the things that they classify. We think that they understand like now the global structure of the object and its context. And these neurons, I think, really do understand the multifaceted nature of all of these complex concepts. And this last method I told you is, you know, a state-of-the-art generative model, which can be used to just have fun and generate stuff. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So now we have a whole other part of the talk, but I think you'll find it fun, and I hope you'll stay with me. Uh, it's uh, it's shorter, so uh, and it has robots that that to damage. So this is a different project we had on the it was on the cover of Nature in 2015. It was about robots that adapt to damage. So here, if you want robots to go do work for you in the world, they're going to have to adapt to damage because the world is a nasty place, especially if you want to like, find survivors after an earthquake. You know, bricks can fall on your legs. And most robots, they fail terribly if they get damaged. So how can we have robots like humans and animals that just adapt rapidly to such damage? So the current approach is um, the, typically you just have like, a large set of contingency plans you hope you've planned for every situation. You have a large suite of sensors. You hope you detect the damage. If you detect the damage, pull the contingency plan off the shelf, run it, and you're good. Obviously, you can imagine that's not going to scale, and it's very time intensive. So there are some learning-based approaches, including some by myself and my friends and colleagues, but they take a lot of trials, and they usually break the robot while they're trying to fix the robot, because they just keep trying things and breaking, uh, and that doesn't work. So what we took inspiration from is animals. Animals can rapidly adapt when damaged, and they don't sit there and launch like a three-week optimization process. They conduct a few intelligent tests, and then they pick a behavior that works despite the injury. So imagine you're hiking around in Yosemite, and you sprain your ankle, right? What are you going to do? Well, a normal optimization algorithm would try, you know, would take, test that behavior, see that it hurts, it doesn't work, doesn't perform well, and then it would try something slightly different, and then slightly different, and then slightly different, and be there for like three weeks trying things that are slightly different, and maybe you would eventually find something that works. That's not what you would do. You would like step on that foot, it would hurt, and then you would say, okay, I can't walk like I normally do, maybe I'll try on my tippy toes, which is a totally different style of walking. You just leap to a totally different behavior. Ow, that still doesn't work. Okay, maybe I'll walk on the side of my foot. I've done that before. Again, trying a totally different thing. That doesn't work. And then you say, all right, I'm going to hop out of the forest, which is another totally different family of behaviors that you're already good at. So how did you do all that? And how did you do it in like 15 seconds? So you can hop back to the medical tent or whatever. That's what we want a machine learning algorithm to do. So these are the pieces we need. We need intuitions about different ways to move ahead of time. I need to know all the different ways I'm able to move. They're all good. I need to conduct a few intelligent tests, and then I need to pick something that works despite the injury so I can go find survivors or go back to the repair shop. So we need an algorithm that's good at the diversity of things, and that all of those things are high performing. So my favorite example of that is evolution, because it produced all of these funny creatures here that are all very different, but very good at whatever it is that they do. Uh, and, oh, I said I was going to show this, but I am going to show it, I forgot. So here's an example of some diversity that we produced in some work that I did at Cornell in an evolutionary algorithm. If you're in Paul's class, he showed this video. We gave it these four building blocks here, which are just different muscles and bones, and then evolution produces this huge parade of totally different, yet high-performing creatures. And in my mind, they kind of have that je ne sais quoi of nature. They're like quirky, but they work, and they're funny to look at. Um, so, the problem is, you would say, oh, here we go, evolution produces a lot of diversity. The problem is, it's a trick. The only way that I was able to produce this video with my collaborators, who were wonderful, is by launching separate runs of evolution, each one of which had a population that was almost exactly the same that produced something, and I take one of them, and then I take a different run of evolution, and I take that thing, and I put them all together, and I show you this Noah's Ark menagerie of parade walkers, and you say, oh, evolution produces a lot of diversity. But every given run of evolution produced almost no diversity. It was that random initial start that it went in different places. That's not what we want. We want all, a whole bunch of diversity that just comes out of one run of an algorithm. So um, my colleague Jean-Baptiste and I invented this algorithm called Map Elites. 
Uh, Jean-Baptiste is also on the Nature paper, the robotics paper that I'm telling you about. He's a wonderful collaborator. And the idea here is that all we're going to do is discretize the space that we care about. So if robots, you might want robots of different height and different weight. Imagine I want to see the best robot of those dimensions. Well, why don't I just actually have a space and I'll just keep the, the champion, the, the fastest or whatever, at each one of these cells. So what I do is I randomly generate an organism, I evaluate it, I figure out its properties, which is in this case its height is 4, its weight is 7, and I figure out the cell that that goes in, and I put it there. And then I'll take something randomly out of the map, I'll mutate it, and it might end up with different properties now because I've mutated it, and if it's the best thing I've ever seen in that cell, I'll keep it. And just keep repeating that process over and over and over again. And eventually, hopefully, I'll get a surface, which is the best I can do everywhere in this space. Which is very different than a traditional optimization algorithm, which gives you one high-performing um, system. So we call this map elites for the multi-dimensional archive of phenotypic elites. So on the same soft robotics problem, we made one dimension the number of voxels and one dimension the amount of this dark blue material. And a classic evolutionary algorithm, this is uh, where it visits over time, voxels versus percent uh, bone. And this is the performance. And if it's hard to see, but they're all pretty black, and it doesn't visit that much of the space. If you add a little diversity, which we've been doing in evolutionary algorithms for like 30 years, you encourage them to go to different spots, you do get better performance. These things get yellow, but it still doesn't visit much of the space. And then map elites, in contrast, is wildly different in what the algorithm does. So this is the exact same amount of computation between here and here. A typical optimization algorithm, even with a pressure for diversity, still visits a very small amount of the space, whereas this new approach kind of illuminates the entire space of possibilities and tells you, oh, you can't really have a fast walker that's only made of bone. You, there's like these cool two peaks. There's a peak here and a peak here. You might not have found this peak if you weren't forced to like try out things in the middle, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why we call these illumination algorithms. They also go by the name quality diversity algorithms because you're looking for high quality solutions of, uh, that are very diverse from each other. Okay, I love looking at this figure. It allows you to kind of go through the map and take out each piece and sweep along key dimensions and see them change. So for example, here I have a creature that's almost full. The percent voxels is almost full. And if I go up in this column here, what it does is it slowly transitions to increasing amounts of blue bone. And these things, if you watch videos of them, look like turtles. Here they like, have very little bone and they're very agile. And here they have like a giant bony shell and like little tiny legs that kind of like scoot along the ground. And you can take that creature and walk it this way until it has fewer voxels, and it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You can see like, these smooth variations. And they kind of look like natural creatures. And you have like the cat family, and you can like, vary between big and small, and like yellow and black, and move around this low dimensional space of possibilities, which is pretty cool. All right, so now how do we use it on a robot? Here's our robot here. Is this the one you're talking about? Yeah. Yes, OK, this is the robot, six-legged. A uh, bunch of degrees of freedom, super hard to optimize, especially in real time once damaged. It has a battery on board and a 3D sensors. So, I promised you an algorithm that would give you intuitions about different ways to move. This is the algorithm. We have a six dimensional space, which is the amount of time that each leg is touching the ground. Okay? So, one, this gate has my right leg touching the ground 0% of the time. And this gate, if I have my right leg touching, you know, you get the idea. So what we're going to do is we're going to search for the highest performing, which in this case is the fastest gate, at every single cell in this six-dimensional hypercube, which is uh, a pretty big space, but it's far smaller than the original search space. I haven't told you much about the original search space, but it suffices to know that there are more possible gates in that search space than atoms in the solar system. And we've now compressed that down to this six by six, you know, six. Uh, uh, six-dimensional cube and in the end of our search process you get this map here which you can uh, you can learn to like view it according to this legend but basically it tells you like how you well you can do everywhere in this space and there's about 13,000 gates in this thing so I've gone from the solar system down to 13,000 all of them are pretty good but some of them are better than others which is why there are different colors I now have intuitions about how to walk without using this leg and this leg and only using these two legs, et cetera, et cetera. Yes? Sorry, what was the measure for better? Uh, speed. Speed. Oh. In simulation. Now, this is a very expensive map to generate. But the cool thing is I can do it ahead of time at the factory and ship this map with every robot. And then if the robot can use it to rapidly adapt to damage when it gets damaged, that's OK. I don't mind doing that. 
Okay, so here's some videos. Everyone likes to see videos. So here is a robot that touches its leg, this particular leg, 10% of the time. And it walks mm -hmm. pretty well. And that, so that's one cell of the map. Somewhere else is a robot that uses this leg 10% of the time. And you can see that here. And I could go through and I could show you a whole bunch of different cells of the map. And what you'd see is that they're very different in style. So this one only uses four legs. That means it doesn't use these two legs very much. It just taps them at the very, very end, et cetera, et cetera. So I won't take you through all of them. But I will show you one, my favorite one of all. And that is in this giant, giant hypercube, there is one cell which was Challenge the robot to walk without ever touching any of its legs to the ground, right? There's the zero, 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 zero column. And we thought it wouldn't be worth even running, and so we almost like didn't do it. But we're like, it's just easier to leave it in the code at this point than to like that one cell knock it out. And then the student, Antoine Colley, who did a fantastic job with this whole paper, he uh, saw that actually that cell lit up in his visualization. He's like, oh no, I have a bug, I have to rerun all my experience. Like it's impossible to walk without touching any of your legs to figure out what's happening. And this is the robot here. It's challenged to walk without touching any of its feet to the ground ever. But yet... <laughs> this is why I love working with evolution. It's so creative. It's constantly on starting and uh, doing wonderfully clever and diverse things. So, nice work, evolution. All right, so now I've got intuition. Very different ways I know how to walk, right? And now I've got the, the first key yellow bubble here. Oh, by the way, here's the legend for how to read this plot if you really want to learn how to visualize and see stuff in six dimensions. So, now the question is I'm damaged. So, this was in simulation on a, uh, and on an undamaged robot. Now I'm damaged, and I'm going to try to find which of these behaviors still work despite the damage. So, which one would you try first? The best one. I agree. Great idea. There it is. Now, if that one doesn't work, which one would you try next? The second best. Well, if you did that, you'd probably have this, right? You try all of these. But remember, if you just touch your foot here and it doesn't work, you probably shouldn't tie the very slight variation on that. You should try a totally different family. So I would argue that if the best doesn't work, I shouldn't try the, the second best. I should try maybe this one, or this one, or this one, or this one. Some combination of different but still good. Right? And that's what this algorithm is going to do. To do that, we use this thing called Bayesian optimization. It tries different types of solutions in a very efficient, optimal way. So here's one walk through the map. I try this behavior here. If it doesn't work, I go here. If it doesn't work, I go here, et cetera, et cetera. And every time that I try something out and it doesn't work, I update my, my understanding of the fact, not only that the thing I tried didn't work, but that all the things nearby are likely to not work. And that's the key. I'm updating my Bayesian posterior inference over my, my, my understanding to rule things out because the map gives you relationships between the points. They're not all separate. If this doesn't work, the thing next to it is semantically similar and probably won't work too. And that's why the map is the key to making this algorithm work. So here's, here's how the whole thing works. I have, first I have to generate the map. So you, we kind of already went through this part. But in this one dimensional example here, not six dimensional, one dimensional, what I'm going to do is I generate a random point. I see how good it is. I go back. I, ge I generate a new Newton version. I run it in simulation. I get a new point, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually, I get the best thing. I, like Over time, I kind of get to the top here. I get the best thing at the different points in the one dimensional descriptor. Now I come up here and I say, I'm going to initialize my prior expectations over these different gates as a function of where they are on the map and how, how well they did in simulation. So this green here is the mean predicted performance. And I have uniform uncertainty, which are this confidence bands, over how well it's going to work. So I don't know almost anything about if this one's going to work better than this one, but I know this one's probably going to be better than this one. So then I conduct an experiment. I'll pick this one here, as you said, the best. I'll try it on the damaged robot. I have to jump two gaps here. I have to jump from simulation to reality and undamaged to damaged. That's a, those are two big gaps. So I try this one and it sucks. This, by the way, this black dotted line is the true performance of the robot. So I try it, it falls down here. Now I will update my prediction, not only of this gate, but also of the nearby gates, to have lower uh, mean prediction nearby. And also I have high certainty that the things nearby are not going to work. 
So I use the distance to propagate both my mean prediction and my uncertainty. As I go farther away from the thing I just tried, I have less knowledge of the mean and higher uncertainty about whether or not that's going to work. And so I drag that down, and then I'll try this one here, and if it's above this orange dotted line, then I'll stop. So what is this orange dotted line? It's just, if I've tried something in reality and it's better than 90% of what I have in the simulation, stop. Because probably that thing in the simulation doesn't work, and so I don't need to try it. So it's an arbitrary stopping criteria. So now we have the whole algorithm, all three bullets. I have the intuitions about different ways to move, a f how to conduct a few intelligent tests, and I know how to pick one that works despite in injury, which is just if the thing that I've tried is better than, um, effectively better than anything I have left to try. So let's see it. So here is an undamaged robot that ships from the robot with a hand-coded gate that's classic in robotics. It moves at 0.25 meters per second and it's in a straight line. Now, damage is going to occur and the robot has to adapt. So the same exact gate, now with this broken leg, moves at 0.3 meters per second and in this curved line here. So the robot needs to adapt. Now lives are on the line. There are people in a, in a building and we need to go find them. So seconds count. So here's the robot. Here's the, the clock. The clock has started. Three seconds have gone by. The first gate we try is right there. And it was 0.13 meters per second and it was curved. So we'll try that, and now note the colors there change. We rule out all of the things nearby. And then we'll try another gate, 0.1 meters per second, still curved. We'll go somewhere else. The map's getting increasingly more blue. But keep in mind, it's a six-dimensional map, so colors will change, not always right next to the point we tried. Now we're on our third experiment, I think. 20 seconds have gone by. The map's pretty blue, but we're getting pretty straight, and we're almost back to that 0.25 meters per second. And then after 26 seconds, we have a straight gate, more or less, and almost exactly back to the original performance of 0.24 meters per second. Now the map still has some red, so the algorithm doesn't stop. It thinks it might do better, and it goes off and it tries one more thing, realizes that actually wasn't good, and it comes back to this one and says that, I'm going to stop with that. Now what's cool is if you watch this gate, which was entirely learned in, uh, on the damaged robot in the real world, it looks dynamic and it kind of looks to me like a wounded animal. So it looks like a crab that somebody stepped on. In fact, when we published this, almost all of the YouTube comments were all about like, the poor robot, you know, you guys are being cruel to this robot. And people are starting to sympathize with it, which is pretty cool. So uh, we tried it on a bunch of different damage conditions. And basically, in every case, the yellow star is where the damage, the damage robot, and this is the, uh, the adapted robot here. And it only takes about a minute to two. So in one to two minutes of real watch time, you can have a robot adapt to damage, which is pretty cool. One funny story about this robot is that uh, my colleagues in France, they wanted to, the university liked the fact that this was on the cover of Nature and a very fancy result, so they invited some VIPs to come visit the lab and see the robot in action. And so my colleagues, of course, got all ready and they made sure the demo was perfect because demos are scary in front of VIP. What they weren't going to do is have it learn. That's too crazy. They just have the final learned behavior to walk in the lab. So they set everything up. We good? We good? All right, see you guys at 8 in the morning. And they go to sleep. And overnight, the university, because the VIPs were coming, decided to send in the cleaning crew, oh. which doesn't normally visit their lab, but did that night. And they polished and mopped the floors. <laughs> so they meet the VIPs in the lobby. They walk to their lab. They walk in, and the floors are super shiny and therefore super slippery. And they were like, ugh, this isn't going to work. They hit play. The robot flails around like it's on ice. And they say, well, we have an algorithm that's supposed to be able to learn. Note that adapting to a different body is no different than adapting to a different environment. I just need to find something in my map that works despite the new situation I find myself in. So they hit play, and they, the algorithm conducted a few experiments, figured out how to get up and tiptoe across the shiny floor. <laughs> so serendipitous VIP demonstration. <laughs> so we did a bunch of science to show that this is works. The key variable that makes this work all of these treatments use the map, the map elites algorithm, and these algorithms, these versions don't. Like if you directly optimize in the original search space, uh, if you um, then basically it doesn't work. You have to go. You can't search in the solar system. You've got to search in the low dimensional map. So basically, we, we, it's like kind of like finding needles in a haystack. Except our algorithm goes and finds all the needles ahead of time, and then has just a pile of needles. And now you're searching in a pile of needles to find the one that works for the particular situation that you're in. 
We tried it on a different robot, I won't show you, we tried it in different environments, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the conclusions of this part of the talk are that this algorithm gives you state-of-the-art robot, robot damage recovery. It adapts in about two minutes of real time to make an algorithm, a robot that can adapt to damages to its body or different environments. And what I love about it is that it combines the creativity of evolution, which I totally love and am fascinated by, but I recognize it's computationally very inefficient sometimes, with the efficiency of Bayesian optimization and more modern techniques that are very data efficient, but don't work in high dimensional spaces and aren't very creative, and it marries them together in a way that takes advantage of the best of both, which is very cool. And it does it via these three bullets. So with that, I really appreciate you staying with me for two long talks, and I will close, say thank you, and take questions. Yes. So the six-dimensional cube you're talking about, was it, how did you learn this, the gates of the robot? Is it in simulation or it, or it was in the, I mean like on the robot itself? Because, in simulation. So it, might, so it is kind of limiting, limiting of the application of robots, uh, to the robots, right? Because you need to have the simulation of the robot your hand or whatever you're trying to optimize over. I uh, mean, a lot of robots have simulators, uh, especially expensive ones. That's one answer. Uh, but the simulators are never very good. So what's nice is that this helps you take advantage of the fact that you have a simulator, but recognizes there's going to be a gap between the simulator and the reality. And then you could just uh, then launch it. And this algorithm will kind of help close that gap. One thing I didn't mention is that even if the robot is undamaged, the algorithm came up with a faster gate than the one we started with because it learns all these different right. ways to work in simulation and then it finds one that works as well as possible and actually it found one that's faster because it was dynamic and hard to program. Right. So it can just work if you have a simulator that's imperfect. A second thing is you can learn a simulator mm -hmm. and then you can do the same thing. So if you have something that conducts a few experiments, builds an internal model or simulator, they're almost always going to be very imperfect. In fact, worse than the hand-coded ones because it's hard. But you could still then do your learning in this, generate the map, and then harness this algorithm to go try to find the best thing that you found in your imperfect simulator in the real world. So even if you don't have a simulator, you could use this, but you'd have to augment it with some sort of simulator learning algorithm, which is a very hard problem. Well, and then potentially, like, these gates might be different to the same builds of the, like, different builds of the same robot, right? I mean, like, like you have different like, actuator on one robot, like the same six point, right? But it has different motors or something. Then it means that the gates optimize it to, like, the same damage of, on both robots might be different, right? Yeah. So in the same sense that I have this six-legged robot and two legs might be broken and this algorithm will still find a solution, right. you could just try it. If you were literally trying to go from like an eight-legged uh, eight robot to a six, you could try it and it might work okay. But it's certainly going to work better if you start in simulation with your eight-legged robot and then just try to transfer. So again, this is from the first talk. So you showed a lot of pictures from the hidden neurons and uh, from the network, but there are millions of neurons in the hidden in the hidden layers. How, which ones, like you make sure that this neuron should be presentable or like because a lot of neurons should not be there because it's uh, neural network is uh, is parameterized, right? So which neurons, like you pick because I read the paper, the paper which is in that and also wrote email to me again, but here oh, we really? have, yeah, you don't have to answer like which neurons you pick by creating these images. So you can pick anyone and look yeah, at no. it, but we cherry picked examples that look somewhat recognized. Now, we didn't only pick the best ones, so we wanted to show some of the diversity. So we picked a few that look good and a few that look a little bit weird and unrecognizable, and he did that, so I wasn't attributed to the exact process. But um, yeah, there's thousands of them, and so we can't show them all in the paper and in the talk, but we did publish I'm pretty sure for some of these papers we published all of them in like a giant data uh, uh, directory and you can go through and browse them all if you want. Which one is it? I think it was probably for the DGNAM paper, but it might have been so for the plug and play. But in any case, even if we didn't, we did publish our code and the train network that we're operating on, which we ourselves just got, I think, from the Caffeine Zoo. Yeah. And so you can just run them and you can go and inspect every single neuron as you like. I think we also tied um, the visualizations up with the DeepViz toolbox that Jason made. So you can go browse an individual neural network, and for each network neuron you click on, you can see the, the visualizations of it. Starting to forget exactly what we did versus what we thought we should do. 
um, if we had infinite time. But the code is available, the networks are available. You can go look at all of these things if you want. And uh, so these are uh, another network, another question for the sampling process, you create like those volcanoes, dollar volcanoes. So does it like create, uh, because in your original paper, I think you, you guys said that we run each chain with uh, 2000, for 2000 time, uh -huh. so 20 something, something like that. Yeah. So does those images which you present in the paper or here, are, is the one after the, your chain mixed or like you start from random random image and then you be sample sampling? In the image. video. Yeah. In the, in the video, the whole uh, kind of collage of volcanoes you showed. Yeah, so there was two different visualizations. The one that you saw with the two different volcanoes strafing across. Yeah. Um, that one is, uh, I believe what we do is we just go through the chain, the chain and we take images in order, but we drop out the ones in the middle that don't have high likelihood according to, I believe, the, um, I forget if it's the reconstruction error step or the activation maximization. I think it's the activation maximization. So basically, because we're adding noise and we're taking steps of reconstruction, we kind of get knocked off the manifold and then we have to like climb back up it. And so when we climb up it, we have high um, likelihood and we show you those. So it's kind of like every, you can think about it like every tenth image, except that's not quite right because it's every high quality image along the sequence. So we are not showing some intermediate ones that are of lower quality, which is one reason why when we show the video of the bird, it's a little bit lower quality because now we're showing you, I think, all of them. And then another visualization we had was we should generate like a whole bunch of pool tables or a whole bunch of volcanoes, and then we T-SNE them, which means that you have similar types of image in similar parts of the region, and then we show, put it into a queue and show it. So in that case, then all the magma, you know, at night images are up here, and then like the no snow on top, blue sky backgrounds are down here, and that's why they're organized. Have you found any dead ones? Um, that's a good question. I know that dead neurons exist. I can't remember to what extent we have found them. Yeah. I mean, there's um, like separate line of works on pruning the neurons. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Like yeah, they're probably out there. I don't, um, I don't recall, but they're probably that Aang or Jason ran into them, and because they were uninteresting, we didn't show them. Sure. They'd just all be black. Good question. Yeah. So the idea of analyzing individual neurons like grandmother cells would seem to mostly make sense if you're dealing with a sparse code, if the network is learning to only activate a very small set of neurons for a given input to get to the output. Is that what's going on in these networks? Do they learn a fairly sparse code so that it kind of like, you know, any given response is based on a, only a very small number of neurons? Or is it learning a more distributed yeah. code? In which case, this analysis is sort of like trying to understand would it make sense to do this analysis and think about individual neurons rather than small groups or patterns of neurons? It's a great question. Uh, it's exactly the kind of questions that we wanted to get at with this work. Uh, it's still mysterious, but I think we've learned a little bit. So the, most of the images I've been showing you are of the class neurons. Mm -hmm. Those by fiat, we have said, yes. are grandmother. Oh, okay. I only want right. to see pictures of my grandmother in this right. cell, so it better right. produce a grandmother cell. Right. And lo and behold, it does. The hidden neurons are much more complicated. So the convolutional filters, those are the ones that get repeated over and over again in the network, they tend to be more kind of canonical things, like a bucket or a glass of beer, a commonly occurring object that you would want to have a detector for. Then uh, we get into that fully connected layer where everything's connected to everything, and then it got weird. You got one-eyed turtles, you've got arches on top of like floating in like a lake. And I think that that's just a property of a much more distributed code, where like in some high dimensional space, mm -hmm. I have things that are like along the arch dimension and the water mm -hmm. dimension and the one, you know, whatever. Right. And so they're much less interpretable. So mm -hmm. um, you get a mixture of both based on the architecture mm -hmm. and maybe um, other properties. For example, if you did add a cost, then you would expect, like you right. said, to have more sparsity and therefore more grandmother mm -hmm. cell abilities. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that, if everything may affect everything, then maybe you get this massive distributed representation that's mm -hmm. totally uninterpretable. Thank you. Yeah? Uh, question? Yeah. Uh, we still have time for a few more questions. Yes. Be considered uh, the opportunity that communication between uh, robots that have been injured would offer you in reducing that uh, is it the uh, space that you've described in your cube. Don't there. come over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things that we didn't do in this work, which is very unusual, is that we didn't try to diagnose what damage had happened and then act upon that. Mm -hmm. 
We just tried to find something that works despite the damage. Now, if you squint just right, you can make an analogy between this is what you do when you sprain an ankle in Yosemite or in a forest. You don't like stop and get like an MRI and figure out exactly what's going wrong. You just know your knee hurts and you better like adapt a different gait. But that's not totally right because you do know your knee hurts and not your shoulder hurts and you're probably not gonna try different versions of moving your arm. You're gonna probably try like your other leg. Um, so yes, either through sensors or through sensors plus communication, you could try to um, have more information about what's gone wrong and what might work. So if one robot mm -hmm. learns that, hey, if I lose this leg, try gate number 465, you could broadcast that. But probably every robot's going to get damaged in a slightly different way, and I'm not sure communication is going to be helpful, but I do think especially the sensors, you know, can be woven in and it would make things even better. Yes. What about the case where you have you're talking about it getting damaged while it's operating. So what happens if it gets stuck or something? If it gets trapped and it needs to use other limbs to do more than just move, it needs to free itself. Yep. Uh, so I can just like invent algorithms on the fly. You could run this thing and uh, try to see, still ask it to move, and maybe it comes up with some weird behavior that based on exactly how it's stuck, it gets it unstuck. But then you could periodically have it go back and like try uh, the original gate or launch the process again. Because once you're unstuck, now you still want move, but you don't want to move in a way that got you out of the hole, you want to like, adapt to a new gate. So yeah, you can just periodically decide to like sample, um, launch the process again, see if you get better. If you don't, go back, and you can play games like that. Uh, yes? Um, <coughs> so the, the map league thing is really cool. I was wondering, Thank you. Um, it seems like in some ways that it's like uh, almost like a hack on what we might call creativity in some circumstances or problem solving. Um, uh -huh. I'm just wondering, do you, do you are you applying this to things that are more like continuous, kind of like uh, artistic, cr creative uh -huh. uh, areas where you don't want to just keep maximizing some specific meaning in a poem or something? Yeah. Or in a story or something? something? So I love all of those questions. So especially since there are people that work on like um, behavior and how people interoperate and act and, and all that, I think that one really uh, cool line of research would be take map elites and use it as like a consulting exercise to encourage creativity in an apartment. Which is to say, have people say, what are the dimensions we care about in this design space? Okay, now I have to find the best version of everything in there. Everything. I gotta find the fastest like, you know, like fat, short robot. Which is, the engineers aren't usually, usually thinking about doing that because that's obviously a bad idea, but maybe doing that gives you some ideas for that then spill over into other design concepts. It just gets you literally thinking out of the box, right? Um, and then to your question, if I'm online, I'll try to show it. Um, um, we took this same idea, map elites, and we tried to um, use it to produce art. And what we did was we um, took an entire map and the maps there were, were different classes of ImageNet. And we said to the artist, I want you to produce the highest performing thing of each type. So I want the best matchstick, the best beer glass, et cetera, et cetera. This was actually why I started the whole project. We wanted to automate creativity. I wanted an artist and I wanted a judge. And I didn't know how to automatically judge images, so I used deep neural nets. And instead of being able to judge the aesthetic quality, I just judged realism. Like, does it look to this neural net like a peacock or a beer glass? And then I had the other thing, which is the generator network, which was evolution trying to evolve images that do that. And then that's when we had the fooling images, because like, it worked perfectly. It lit up, it made the judge perfectly happy, but it looked like nonsense. We published that, and then we got derailed into trying to make it work. And eventually we came back and said, hey, it works, so let's try it again. So now we have this stuff here, which are, I don't know if you can see, this is like a fake bagel, this is a fake match, fake strawberries, and whatever. And eventually we got all these super cool images of different classes, and I think it's an example of automated creativity because, um, because map elites is under the hood. So if I take the best thing I've ever seen of one type, like maybe the best uh, strawberry, maybe the mutation off of that produces the best peach and the best cantaloupe, et cetera. And maybe if I directly optimize for cantaloupe, I won't get a good cantaloupe. But if I go to strawberry first, then I can go and produce a good cantaloupe. So you have all these like stepping stones you're collecting that you can jump off of. So you see this beacon up here, which I love? There is this thing here, which is a phylogeny of images. 
So at some point, there's this mutation from this to this design motif here of this dome, and that radiates out like an adaptive radiation to become the best volcano, the best mosque, the best water tower, beacon, yurt, church, planetarium, obelisk, and uh, I don't even can't read that. So all these different things that are related. Also, this is really cool. This is the best water tower. We we're trying to evolve a water tower here. If you just evolve to the water tower, you go to local optimum. It gets close to this dome, and then all the mutations from there can't go anywhere. It's stuck. But if you allow it to like go in one direction and then jump to a different category and collect stepping stones, and you never know like what technological innovation here is going to fuel technological innovation there, if you allow the process to jump through design space, in this case by allowing images to become like the best volcano can jump over and become the best beacon, then here you go. It gets to this dome, and then it gets stuck, and something else comes in here, the different design, and eventually produces this thing, which looks much better, much more like a water tower than that or that. And so, yes, we use all of these techniques to try to automate the generation of creativity within these computational systems. Over time? Thank oh. people more time. Yeah. Yeah. So one, one final comment. We submitted this to an art competition, because, and the, the judges did not know it was computationally generated, and it was competitive. And not only did they get accepted, it was given an award and put on the wall. <laughs>